Hello, everyone. Hi, everyone. If there is anyone there, I'm so sorry about the palaver with the times today. But um, Maya is a very busy woman with the council and she had to have a meeting about the planning due to the government's new white paper. Oh, I feel very up with the times talking about such matters. Um, so, and I know it's very hot weather. So if you're there, please send me a message to say you are so I can see. So we don't want to be sitting chatting to no one. Anyone there? Say hello if you are. Oh, Dean. Oh, good, good. So, glad I've got one guest. Good. That's super. Oh, lovely lady from Mercy Island as well. Oh, oh and here's the room from Japan. So now we can say we're international, which I like. Oh, lovely. So let me tell you a bit about my guest, who actually is one of the very first people I met here when I moved to Hastings. I'd only lived here. Oh, hi, Tony Calder. I'd only lived here about a week. And it was my 60th birthday. I knew about four people who lived here. So it was a bit tragic. But I still had a party because I like, I like a party. And then my neighbour says, oh, I'll get more people. I'll phone Maya. She lives across the road. So she came to my house and I met her. And we've been friends ever since. I don't see her that often. She's always very busy with her council stuff and her Afghani stuff. And then... Often I see her going up and down on her bike. She's very fit and all that. But she's very interesting. I'm, oh, hi, Mac Thomas. You're a local person, aren't you? Oh, David Sands. Oh, good. There's quite a few people here. That's marvellous. So she's very pretty. So I hope you do a lovely picture of her. Oh, hi, Rachel Orton. I haven't seen you on here for ages. Lovely to see you. And I might as well just introduce Maya now. So welcome, Maya. She's there somewhere. Hello, everyone. Hi, Maya. <laughs> Hi. How are you? Oh, what lovely smile you've got. I sound like an old lady, don't I? Um, so we've got different people back to at back house today because Katie Baird's on holiday. She's had an injury already. She's always injuring herself, but. Little, there's Lil Dan and Lily Kim behind the scenes from actual Hastings Isolation Station, new offices. It's all very glamorous. But can you make me smaller and Maya bigger? There, no, the other one for me. There we go. Perfect. So everyone, it's, do you want to say hello to everyone, Maya? Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us today. It is baking hot, so I feel particularly honoured that you have decided to join us um, on this glorious day and being inside. Um, so thank you very much. And hello, everybody who's joined the show, particularly the viewer in Mersey Island. I've got a younger sister who lives in Mersey Island. So uh, uh, big shout out there. And also our listener in Japan. I visited Japan on a couple of occasions and I love Japan so much. I was there exactly this time two years ago, actually. So very fond memories. And she does absolutely lovely pictures. She'd do such a lovely picture of you. It'd be gorgeous. Oh, hope so. <laughs> no, I know I'm not going to have to be ask you many questions because I know you're very well versed in the world of public speaking. <laughs> so I'll try. Like start off. I always like to start off to find out about little people's childhoods and find out where you were brought up and what was that. Hi, Deborah Holdsworth. And see, where were you brought up and what was your family like? Oh, uh, so I was born in the late 70s, believe it or not. Um, and it was the same year Margaret Thatcher was elected as prime minister, 1979. And I was born in a council flat in Hackney in the back room that looked over Regent's Canal. Uh, and I don't know, for some reason, my mom just decided to have a home birth. She was a bit of ahead of her time in terms of like, you know, home births and things like that. So, yeah, I was born at home in late December. Uh, I'm the youngest of my mum's children. I've got an older sister who's about three years older than me. And I grew up in that flat in Hackney, in Haggerston, in Hackney, uh, and lived there until I was about eight, until I was 18. Um, and then at the age of 18, I went to university, studied history. And then at the age of 23, I moved down to Hastings and I've been so here. But why did you come to Hastings? What made you come here? 
Oh, I had some friends down here and uh, I used to come to visit and I just really love the beach. I like the architecture and I kind of fancied living by the sea for a few years. So I, I moved down in 2003 thinking, oh, you know, this may be a sort of stepping stone into my next move somewhere else as a young person. And I, I don't know, I just never left really. Um, but I think for me, you know, growing up in London, obviously London is an amazing place. It's brilliant. I love going there. But I think it's kind of hectic growing up there, you know, as a, as a child. It's not like down here you can go to the beach, you've got country parks. You know, an, an urban environment is quite tough to grow up in, I personally think. Um, but I did. I really I, I really appreciate my childhood, appreciate my school that I went to. It was super multicultural Skinner's Girls for School, a uh, Skinner School for Girls. It was uh, in Clapton. Uh, so it was super multicultural. I had about 60 languages spoken in my school, just very standard, comprehensive, very multicultural. What can you say? Hackney in the 90s. Uh, was that uh, just preaching? Pardon? Was that seagulls just screeching behind yeah, you? Yeah, yeah, that's... Um, I don't hear them that loud in my flat. I'm only across the road. I, well, Sue, I'm literally looking at your flat now, so I'm surprised. Oh <laughs> I, can, I can actually see your flat and your car. So I, I'm surprised that you can't hear that seagull. I've got the windows closed, though. <laughs> I've got every so, single window in the house open. And when did your, your mum lives above you now, doesn't she? Uh, yeah, my mum lives above me. But I always like to point out three locked doors, everybody. I'm not just a middle-aged woman living with their mum. That was a uh, different flat. But did she follow you? Yeah, she followed me. So I moved down in 2003 and then we got flats here where we live. And the flat above me was available. So she moved down in 2006. So it was just really lucky that, you know, the building became empty and um, they were all available at the same time. Really lucky. Oh, that's amazing. So what job did you do when you came down here? Um, I used to clean in Bexhill. I used to have to wake up at 6am. I used to cycle to Bexhill, believe yeah. it or not, in the pouring rain. And uh, yeah, I was a cleaner. That was my first ever job. And I used to clean out in Hurstman Zoo as well, hotels. Yeah. This oh, is in that, hotels. I, I love that name. What, how do you say that place again? Hurstman Zoo? Hurstman Zoo. I never know yeah. how to say it properly. Nice. Have you been out to the observatory? Yeah, I went there to see my friend. Oh, it's amazing there, isn't it? Yeah. I love gazing at the observatory. It's incredible. Hmm. And did you have an interest in politics when you were a teenager? Yeah, I was always one of those slightly cliche, um, sensitive teenagers. I was into sort of dolphins and saving whales and Greenpeace and all that sort of stuff. I had like posters of dolphins on my bedroom wall. Uh, I had adopted a humpback whale by the time I was sort of 14. I became vegan when I was 15, which was in 1995. And that was pretty hardcore to go vegan yeah. back then. You that was vegan. You're not vegan now, are you? No, I stopped being vegan about five years ago. Um, I was in Afghanistan for about four months working with the Afghan Peace Volunteers, which is one of the things I do. And we were living communally and eating communally. And I just felt it was a bit too entitled to inflict my militant vegans on people living in the poorest country in the world. So I just shut up and ate what I was given. Yeah. Um, didn't really, I couldn't get my head around meat, so I never actually ate the meat. But all the young people I was living with, they were very happy to eat meat. So that was not a problem. But, yeah, I just sort of went with the flow and ate dairy products when I was out there. You have to really sometimes, don't you? Yeah. And, right, yeah. <laughs> You're doing the cleaning. Oh, yeah. And then did you join a sort of political party down here or anything? Um, I was I was part of various anti-war organisations. So 2003, when I moved down, that was the year um, Britain was part of the invasion on Iraq. So you remember it was in March 2003 and there was massive protests. At that particular point, I was actually living up in Liverpool, mm -hmm. um, getting the bus down to London every weekend and going on all the demos. And I was really you know, passionate about protesting against the war. And I was in an anti-war group up there, um, Liverpool Stop the War. So I 
It's an incredible, like Liverpool is such an incredible place in terms of socialists and political activity and trade unions. They've got such a strong history and really passionate activists up there that that was a very inspiring experience for me. And then in 2003, I went to New York on a bit of a jolly with some friends who um, I happened to be working with them when I was in Liverpool, working in the same bar. Um, up in Liverpool, and they were they were like, "Hey, let's all go to New York. We've got friends who are living out there, and they were all Irish." So we went to live in Maspeth, Queens, and there's a huge yeah. Irish community out there, and practically half their village um, in Ireland. They lived in the, the the village of Newry. They had relocated to Maspeth, and then they even had their like daily newspaper shipped out every day. So it was one of those kind of Irish expat communities, and yeah. I was sort of, I don't know, pl plonked in the middle of it, sharing with all these Irish people. Um, and yeah, we were out there for a couple of months. And then I decided to try and work with an anti-war group out there. So I contacted one in Chicago and they were like, yeah, sure, come on over. Got the Greyhound, 24 hours on a Greyhound, got there. You're and, very adventurous, aren't you? Well, I was 23. I wouldn't you do that now. Now, yeah. I think when you're 23, you can rough it on a greyhound and you think it's like amazing, wild fun. Now I would probably, I would struggle. But uh, uh, yeah, so I got there and I worked with them for a month and they were really hugely inspiring. They were actually a peace group called Voices in the Wilderness who were going into Iraq and breaking economic sanctions. So the US, along with the UK, had placed economic sanctions on Iraq for over 10 years because they were trying to get Saddam Hussein to negotiate um, the oil prices that they wanted to buy and sell at. Um, and he wasn't doing that. So they put economic sanctions on him. And they were take and that included things like medical supplies, um, penicillin, incubators for babies. Uh, the US and U UK completely stopped trading those items with, with Iraq. And obviously it's, it's not Saddam Hussein who suffered, it's the, it's the civilians, it's the people who always suffer in these sorts of situations. So I was working with, with this peace group in their office, doing their admin and meet people coming back, hearing their stories. And I was like massively inspired, it was 2003. And I thought, well, you know, this is definitely something that I would like to continue doing when I get back to the UK. So when I got back here, um, I decided to move down to St. Leonard's and then I was working with a few anti-war groups down here. There was one called Justice Not Vengeance that I worked with and Hastings Against the War. And then up in London, I was working with peace groups up there. I'd get on the train and, and go up and do stuff. Um, and then I was working part time in our local Whole Foods shop, Trinity Whole Foods. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I was the, uh, the girl in Whole Foods shop. And I was cooking their takeaways at the time, doing their sandwiches and, you know, I don't know, bits and bobs, takeaway food that you could get in there. It was quite, I mean, I loved it because I like cooking. It's one of my great loves. So it was actually a really cushy job. Um, and you got a 25% discount from Trinity, which anyone in Hastings would know that that is valuable indeed. Um, so, yeah, I was doing that for a few years. And then in 2005, I was arrested under the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act. And is that poster behind you? About um, so that is actually, that's from the Hastings Observer. Somebody, Pete Quinnell actually kind of stole that off a billboard for me. So that's a genuine, I didn't like mock that up myself. That's a genuine poster that's kind of hilarious, isn't it? Yeah, it was about me. I can't remember. No, it wasn't for this one. That was for another protest. Oh, no. Tell us about the first one. <laughs> oh, but born in 2005, um, received a lot of publicity because it was the I was the first person prosecuted under this new piece of legislation called the Serious Organised Crime and Police Act, and that that piece of legislation restricted um, peaceful protest around Downing Street and Parliament Square, and it was basically to get rid of this protester called Brian Hoare, who some of you may remember he was permanently camped outside parliament with all these placards of like oh, you know like yeah. yeah brian he's he was alleged i mean unfortunately sadly he's passed away now oh. but he was there for i think about 10 years day in day out and he was you know he was a real real character indeed so yeah. they passed this legislation partly to get rid of him because his his placards were taking up a whole pavement now obviously you get a lot of tourists there they're all 
photograph in Parliament turning around and photographing his posters about how Britain was responsible for war crimes and killing children with white phosphorus and all this sort of stuff. So um, they passed this legislation. I was the first person prosecuted under it. And then there was a big media fanfare about it, you know, like freedom what of... What the actual... How did you get arrested? Oh, so I was standing opposite the cenotaph and I was reading the names of British soldiers and Iraqis who had died in the ongoing war in, in Iraq, mm. um, naming... Uh, naming the dead it was called and the police came up to to me and said you know there's this this new piece of legislation that's passed you haven't asked for permission to be here we're going to arrest you unless you move and it was all sort of planned out before and I'd, I'd considered it very carefully and I thought well you know I'm just gonna gonna keep reading those names and doing my peaceful protest it's uh, act of civil disobedience um so that's what I did got arrested you um, anything wrong were you really no, it was a peaceful ceremony. So, I mean, bizarrely, I had the the nation behind me, more or less. I had everyone from the Daily Mail uh, to the Telegraph to the Guardian, all sort of very positive um, stories, criticizing criticizing the government mainly, which yeah. is kind of hilarious because it was a Labour government, obviously Tony Blair's government, and I'm now very much involved with the Labour Party, and I'm a Labour councillor. So it's it's kind of kind of funny. <laughs> To some, <laughs> probably not so funny if you're a, a supporter of Tony Blair. <laughs> and how long did you have to actually go to prison? Or did you just uh, no, I received a fine. I think it was about £250. And then it mysteriously dropped off my record because I think they didn't want to martyr me by sending me to prison. Yeah. But this, this poster behind me, that was for a protest that I did in 2007 outside Northwood. Uh, GCHQ so that's where the Brit British military make all their strategic decisions about what they're going to do um, in various locations around the world militarily and we were protesting a um, NATO helicopter bombing of a Afghan village where I think it was 47 civilians had been killed at a wedding so we were dressed up as if we were going to you know a, a, a solemn wedding yeah. and John was actually there he did a speech john mcdonald mp ex ex chancellor of the exchequer oh, i see i'm not very good on politics <laughs> well it was his it's his um it's his constituency in north yeah. london so he, he we invited him to come along and he said a few words and then we marched up to northwood and we lay in the road for about it seemed like hours it was about an hour and a half and it was pouring of rain and it was freezing cold and i was lying on a bin bag in a weird kind of um, what I thought might have been a sort of bridesmaid outfit, but in fact I got from a charity shop in St Leonard's, and it looked like I looked like some sort of fairy that should be on a a, a wedding cake. I looked ridiculous yeah. and uh, sm like splashed with fake blood, lying on a freezing cold tarmac road on a bin bag for two hours in the rain. And then finally we got arrested. Thank God we got arrested. And I got to be, I got to go in the van. Um, and then we all, there was about six of us. We all stood trial. We argued that um, the, the old necessity. So a lot of activists argue this, this legal um, line called necessity. So by law, you're, it's permissible to break a law in order to stop a greater harm from happening. So you can walk into a building that's on fire um, so you're breaking and entering to save, say, a baby that's in the building yeah. that would die otherwise. So we were arguing that um, by protesting outside Northwood um, military base, we were stopping a greater harm from happening. Um, obviously, the judge didn't go for that. We got found guilty. Mm -hmm. got, I think it was about a £400 fine then. And if you don't pay your fine, you have you have months, years. I think I had about two years of the bailiffs knocking on my door. Yeah. And... To avoid them because they could once they come in they can you know take your property away from you so yeah. you, you avoid them coming in but I think I had about two years of hiding behind the sofa and then one day they knocked and I knew it was them and so I was talking to the bailiff through the letterbox and um, I had a hunch that he might be ex-services so there's a lot of people who were in the military who then go into security yeah. and bailiffs. Um, and so I explained that I was at the cenotaph um, remembering the war dead, remembering British soldiers who'd put their life on their line 
um, and how they're not being treated well by the government. So a lot of, you know, British service people who have got PTSD, who've got injuries, they're not being looked after at all well by the British government. And I just think, you know, if someone has laid their life on the line for, for this country, you know, the, the government has a responsibility to look after those people because, you know, the, the chances are they're going to come back damaged and they need lifelong care um, because of the, 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 the you know, the, the, the hit that they've ta taken. Yeah. Um, so anyway, I was sort of talking, talking about this through the door with the guy and he, I could sense that he was on side and he said, well, look, if you let me in, I've got to come in to check that you haven't got anything in your property. Um, I'll sign the bit of paper and you can go back to court. So I took the gamble and let him in. He he signed and he could see I didn't have anything of value, signed yeah. my bit of paper, got returned to court, uh, said my thing in court about, you know, war crimes and trying to, to you know, <laughs> stop British, aggressive British foreign policy, uh, which ultimately backlashes on us because we end up having terrorist attacks on this country because people elsewhere in the world or people who are even from this country are annoyed with our government because of you know what we're doing abroad so made that sort of speech in court the magistrate's judge was not impressed and sent me to Bronzefield Her Majesty's prison Bronzefield which was in Middlesex uh for weeks but I kind of I didn't have a hard time I, I was there for uh, it was a two-week sentence. Yeah. So, I mean, for me, it kind of reminded me of my girls' school back in Clapton. Yeah. So it's just, you know, I, I could have been back at school, to be honest. Like, the kind of, you know, it was it was very similar. I, I actually thrive in female environments. But at the same time, I was only there, you know, for, for two weeks. It's not like, you can, I could really see that bullying would set in if you were sort of a bit weak, um, a little bit not you know against the groove they would they would, you would start to get bullied so I wasn't there long enough and I'm, the worst thing about prison is seeing you know vulnerable women who have slipped through the net um in in this state institution that doesn't help you so you know there's obviously a lot of sex workers there and actually their time in prison they had a better quality of life in prison than they did on the outside yeah. uh, there was a lot of like repeat offenders who were involved with petty crime to support their families um and a lot of women with drug issues so it's you know it's a, it's a it's a concentration of some of the poorest people in society and some of the most vulnerable and some of the most abused women and that this is what the state does with them and you get released from prison you haven't really been helped in any way you you're not like back on your feet if anything it's what it's a lot worse because for most of the women they get separated from their children and that's probably the worst sentence for for women. Um, so they're just sitting there, separate from their children, thinking about their kids, hoping that they get them back if they're in foster care or wherever. So yeah, it's it's another side. It's another side of society that um, impacts the the poorest and most vulnerable detrimentally. So that was probably the most you know interesting thing about prison or the the take home message. Yeah, but I'm sure. You're a very tough kind of person. I'm sure you cope quite well, didn't you? And I'm sure, I think probably you were a ray of light for some of the people. <laughs> uh, them up. I'm daughter. okay. I mean, I get on all right with people. So, you know, I just sort of, keep, I'm good at keeping my head down. You know, you know, if you grow up in Hackney, you, you're streetwise, you know how to spot a dangerous situation, how to keep your head yeah. down, not to say ridiculous things at bad times. So yeah, that was okay. I mean, it was fine. We, you know, there was a lot of chat in the prison cells, doing hair, um, oh, kind of stuff. <laughs> and then, what happens when you came out of prison? What happened to you then? Uh, nothing very much. That was kind of normal, really. Just went back to my normal life. You're um, still working at Trinity Whole Foods. No, I haven't worked there for years. No. Um, yeah, well over ten years. Um, but uh, yeah, I miss those days. I miss that 25% staff discount. Uh, and sort of temporary jobs. I've always, well, I've always had part-time jobs. So for a long time, I was a uh, administrator for a puppet theatre company by Alex Park. Um, so I was just doing sort of, you know, part-time admin for yeah. a long time. And then around 2011, 
um, I started to focus on Afghanistan and to take delegations of peace activists out to Kabul to, to work yeah. and see with the Afghan peace volunteers. So that became more my full time thing. And how did that all get? How did you manage to enable all those people to get over there? And so, I mean, there's a bit of a long story about that. So it all sort of started. Well, it's very interesting. So I don't know enough about it. And you're explaining it so simply and well. I'm loving it. Oh, well, that's good. Um, but it kind of, I mean, I guess my standing in regards to Afghanistan started in around 2009. So I was prosecuting the British government for complicity in war crimes. So <laughs> that's a bit convoluted. But basically what was happening is that the British government had signed what's called a memorandum of understanding. So it's a bit like a contract with the Afghan government saying that if British troops captured anyone in in the theatre of war and thought and did a bit of questioning and thought that maybe these people were part of the Taliban they would yeah. then hand them over to the Afghan authorities um yeah. what's happening was the Afghan authorities um were then torturing those people for confessions uh, and then those people were then sentenced on the basis of these confessions that were gained out of torture and we had evidence, um, um, we, we felt, which proved that the British government knew that when people were handed over, they were tortured, which obviously contravenes international laws around, you know, um, yeah. rights, universal declaration of human rights. You know, you've got a right not to be tortured. So we were, in effect, Britain was, in effect, um, complicit in war crimes. So we had this huge judicial review. I was in the high court. You know, I, again, I was in just like some outfits cobbled together from um, St. Leonard's charity shop, sat in the high court with all these, you know, guys with the white, white ringlet wigs yeah. and the robes and, you know, very high powered individuals that you would never, ever come into contact with yeah. otherwise. And the high court is it's such a different world. You know, you really get an idea of how the elite live. And then I got to go for lunch with my QC, Michael <gasps> Ford. And uh, yeah, we went into this, this, right opposite the High Court, there's this kind of maze of um, offices, le legal offices, chambers, and there was this food court that they all go to. And like, just the, the most expansive um, food court you've ever seen, very exclusive, you could only go in if you were a lawyer. And you don't even pay for it at the end, you, you, you laid all laid all, all the food you possibly can onto your plate, and it's just every, there's even champagne there at lunch. Um, and you, you, you know, you pile all the food up onto your plate and then you just go and sit down and it's, it's put on a tab and then some legal chamber somewhere, um, like the matrix or whatever, they pick the tab up. Uh, so nice. that's a, that's a top tip if ever you can wrangle your way into a, a huge <laughs> food court. Um, but yeah, so we did, we did this judicial review two weeks and at the end, the, um, the judges ruled, um, what they called a partial victory. So they said that it was very worrying what was happening in Afghanistan and they advised the British government to change their practices. I mean, they could have come out a lot stronger. In Canada, the same, um, the same legal case was taken out against the Canadian government and they came out of it really badly to the extent they destabilised their coalition government. Um, but, you know, Britain is quite status quo. We're very, you know, we're quite a conservative, small C uh, and, and big C country. So... You know, the, the, the legal system was not going to come out um, lambasting the, the, the British military. So, you know, it is what it is. But we, we, we shone a light on an abuse that was taking place. And that was positive. Uh, so I'd done these various things. So we did the protest that I went to prison for, background, and uh, the High Court Judicial Review. And then there was one of our the contacts that I had made when I was in Chicago back in 2003 in Voices in the Wilderness. Kathy Kelly, she had found this youth peace group in Kabul who were, you know, doing these peace projects, and she put an international call out for activists to join her if, she, if we wanted to on on short delegations, a couple of weeks long. And I thought, well, you know, I've 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 done this background work on Afghanistan. There's no, it's a bit of a forgotten war. There aren't many activists in the UK focusing on it. So I decided to go out in 2011 and uh, meet this peace group. So 
that's what I did. And that was the sort of turning point. I met all these amazing young activists who had grown up knowing nothing but war. Every single one of them had incredible mm -hmm. stories. Uh, and I, I just really fell in love with a, a, a group of young people who were super inspiring. And um, I'm still very much in contact with them today. They've, these, these young people who were teens at the time have all grown up, they're all married, and they've started their own projects. Um, so they've all kind of moved to different parts of Afghanistan and they're, they're, they've started all their own little projects. So we, what I do now with um, the group that I founded, Voices for Creative Nonviolence, we send out money. Um, we do fundraising and send out money to help them with their projects. And then here we run campaigns, raising awareness, and I do talks and I do a lot of workshops in schools. So I go into schools and do a lot of like, you know, peace, anti-war. Um, what's work it like actually you know? living in Afghanistan? If you live there, do you feel there's a war going on the whole time or is there any sort of normal life? Um, it's pretty crazy. So I've only ever been to Kabul. Um, there was the in the last 10 years there's been increasing violence within Kabul so when I started going out there it was considered the safest um, location in Afghanistan and now it's considered the most dangerous because there's suicide bomb attacks every few days um, and big ones like you know you get between 50 and 100 people each time being killed by the Taliban um, and no, you you wouldn't you wouldn't think there isn't a war going on. It's one of the yeah. poorest countries in the world, and they've had incessant war for forty years actually, because it started with the Russians. So it's been nineteen years now that Britain's been involved with this ongoing war. So if you remember after nine eleven, um, NATO and the US uh, ploughed into Afghanistan to topple the Taliban to catch Bin Laden. Um, for them, the Taliban, they just, they fled Kabul and they've been laying low, full well knowing that anyone who, any foreign power that tries to conquer Afghanistan normally leaves with their tail between their legs as the Russians did after 10 years of trying to defeat the Taliban because it's it's a terrain that Afghans really understand and they're very determined um, to defend. So um, that's been going on for 19 years and the, the Taliban are not going anywhere. They've, they, they've got... Well, See what the problem is and what the Taliban are trying to do. So the the Taliban, they're an extremist organisation that took yeah. took Afghanistan over in I think it was about ninety six. And are they Afghani people? Or are they from another? Yeah. Country? All right. So it, it's founded, the Taliban is unique to Afghanistan and it was founded by a guy called Mullah Omar who had one eye and he's like classic, you know, Captain Captain Hook type figure. Um, and he he kind of founded the Taliban because it was very, it was very sort of lawless at the time. They were in civil war. We, they'd had 10 years of the Russians who left, and then the country went into civil war. The Taliban rose up, and people thought, well, maybe, you know, they're kind of extremists, they're kind of strict, but maybe there will be law and order, and people can kind of have some stability. So when they rolled in, I think some people thought this could be all right, this could be okay for Afghanistan, maybe. It was stable government, which is what people really wanted. But, you know, it was a matter of days before they published their very quite famous um, list of commandments of all the things that you weren't allowed to do, which included things like uh, listening to pop music or flying a kite or, you know, men had to, 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 to have beards and women had to wear the burqa and wasn't allowed, the women weren't allowed out of the house. So it was just a, it was a very extremist interpretation of of Islam um, infli inflicted on Afghans. Uh, so the Taliban doesn't exist anywhere else outside of Afghanistan. They are in, in on the border in Pakistan, yeah. uh, but they're kind of made up of a tribe called the Pashtun, who are um, uh, you know they're, they're a tribe that live on sort of the area between Afghanistan and Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, Maybe I'm getting a bit too detailed here. <laughs> no, I don't really understand. Why well, I have got a question for you though, because I was wondering with the coronavirus, hmm. if wars are still going on. Yeah, it, very much so. Well, yeah, they just ignore it all. It's it's just another it's another problem on top of everything else. Yeah. So not only is Afghanistan one of the poorest countries in the world, they've got over a million people who are internally displaced, living in refugee camps. Um well, you know, I think, oh, I'm trying to remember all my statistics now about how awful it is. 
uh, in things of like you know twenty four percent. Can you just go to the water? Can you just go? Yeah, you can go. Yeah, like yeah, there are stores you can go to, but um, you know, just just severe poverty, absolutely severe, and loads of street kids um, in Kabul. You when you come out of the airport. Uh, immediately as soon as you get out of the airport you're just surrounded your vehicle surrounded by street kids who are trying to sell you chewing gum or clean your window or you know waft some incense into your window for good luck it's it's heartbreaking the number of street kids who who are in Afghanistan, in Kabul and Afghanistan and kids who have to work it's it's very much the status quo that a lot of kids have part-time jobs to help their families so coronavirus is just another thing on top of everything else in terms of really bad access to healthcare. Um, you know, it's it's an awful human human rights, especially for women. Um, there haven't been tremendous gains in the last eighteen years. There have been some gains for women um, yeah. in terms of education, especially for girls in Kabul. Um, but generally, there's 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 still you know back in the country in the provinces, the rural provinces. It's still quite archaic um, in terms of women's rights. So, yeah, it's been decades of war and not much improvement for the Afghan, ordinary Afghan person. You know, people moan about living in this country. You I know. Think, you've got it so easy, really, when you think what other things yeah. are in the world. It's yeah. It, so, yeah. It's hard though if you don't go to these places, and then especially if you don't form relationships with people who are, mm. you know friends, you can't. It's really hard to imagine. It's just because there's. I think people have a kind of uh, fatigue because there's so many bad things happening in the world, and you just hear it all the time. I think people have just got this kind of shutter that they just. Maybe it's a mental coping thing because if you took on all the worries of the world, you just you wouldn't get anything. It would be overwhelming. Yeah, but, something on television i don't know what it was you know about terrible countries i think isn't it you know the way the countries they want their stuff and they want that stuff and it's kind mm. of a pot, pot luck where you're born isn't it it's such a and, matter of luck and the weather because the weather mm. makes such a difference to where mm -hmm. you live isn't it? because there's yep. really hot countries they can't grow food they can't grow this yeah and it's so unfair really i mean it is world it would be the world would be kind of ruled for everyone and everyone would share everything. Yeah. Still, and this is mine, this is mine, you can't have it. And I just think it's yeah. so weird. And the it's way so that backwards, that idea. Done. It's, it's so backwards that people, you know, we, we're at a point now, we have to share resources. There's no sort of thinking about it in terms of climate change. You know, we're all in it together now. Um, the, the pandemic was a little bit of a, a dry run because compared exactly. to the impact of climate change, COVID-19 is just going to be like a walk in the park. So we need to all start thinking a lot more collectively. We need to be sharing our resources. And this is a matter of human survival, of the, you know, the survival of the species. I mean, there will be an elite crew who will no doubt escape to Mars with Elon yeah. Musk and yeah. maybe Trump's clone. Uh, but I, I personally don't want to be on that spaceship. Um, no. I mean, if there's a world disaster, I want to die. I don't want to have to live with you horrible people. I'd rather just... Yeah. Them. But yeah. You know, women are treated differently as well. It's unbelievable. Yeah. So, and like racism, sexism, everything. Yeah. Everyone be accepted for what they are, shouldn't they? And have the same rights and the same freedoms. Amen. Yes. <laughs> Oh, perhaps I'm being an activist now. That'll be it. Yeah, you are. Sue, you are a hardcore activist. And look at you. I can see that. Is that the atomic bomb behind you? Yeah. Is that, is that Hiroshima or Nagasaki? I don't know. My friend is it. Oh, okay. So the, the anniversary was Nagasaki was yesterday. Oh. And it was Thursday. So there's been peace events around the world to mark the dropping of the atomic bomb on those two Japanese cities. Well, People even think that that's the right thing to do. It beggars belief. I know it's unbelievable. Like uh, Hiroshima, one hundred twenty thousand people, civilians instantly killed. Nagasaki, eighty thousand instantly, and then generations of cancer. It's unbelievable. Look, what would ever go through your brain to invent and then make and then drop such a horrific, barbaric instrument on you know people? I can't really even understand. 
how some people can kill people in cold blood. That's one mm. of those. But people who go out to kill thousands and thousands of people mm. just because they want something for themselves. Yeah. No, There's a lot of brainwashing. Like, I'm sure the pilot who dropped it must have felt super guilty for the rest of his days. But, you know, you get brainwashed by patriotism and, you know, not to question your government or, you know, what you're doing. It's, there's a lot of indoctrination that goes on within the military and within society in general, you know, with, within our media, constant brainwashing. Right. So we've, we've had Afghanistan. Let's talk about you now and your local, more local matters to Hastings. Oh, OK. So, <laughs> how did you become a counsellor? Um, I became a counsellor in May 2018. Um, and it was totally unplanned. I as you can... came round after and I was thrilled. <laughs> oh, yeah, I came round to yours on the day of the election. Yeah, and I was I was like, Sue, I've just been elected. <laughs> so, yeah, I got I got talked into standing as a councillor because our, our local Labour Party, they had a, a day whereby they were trying to get all the um, female members of the Labour Party to come along to an event. Um, to think about becoming councillors and when I went yeah. to this I kind of got talked into it with the you know the idea of wouldn't it be revolutionary if 50% of the people you know controlling the country were women wouldn't that be real revolution we and 100% I, <laughs> yeah we want 100% but 50 would be a good start um, so I thought okay you know uh, yeah and um, so I filled out the application form and then I got empanelled and selected to stand in Hollington. And then we did a lot of canvassing, a lot of knocking on doors, meeting people, electioneering, and I, I got elected in 2018. So I'm in, this is my, been a councillor for two years now. Yeah. And what's your um, special, um, you've got a special post, haven't you? <laughs> oh yeah, so last year, the council, Council passed a climate emergency motion at full council, so acknowledging the report that came out by the IPCC, uh, International Panel for Climate Change, I think that's the, the, the acronym, and they basically said that the planet has 10 years to, um, uh, in order to stop irreversible tipping. So yeah. if temperature increases by more than 1.5 degrees, in the next 10 years, then, you know, we're, we're beyond the tipping point that we can't reverse. So we passed a motion at full council saying that um, we, we were going to try and make Hastings carbon neutral by 2030. Yeah. Um, it was part of, you know, getting the motion passed and organising councillors to, 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 to speak on it. And um, the leader of the council at the time, Peter Chowney, he is, he was, is very much um, concerned about climate change and very much dedicated to tackling the issue so he created a climate change post within the cabinet and because I showed a lot of uh, interest and passion around the subject yeah. he um, made me the, the the cabinet portfolio holder for climate change sustainable development and biodiversity so yeah. that post existed for a year and we created a um, climate change strategy within the council looking at you know how we were going to get to carbon neutrality and we published that the week we went into lockdown so it was kind of overlooked because we were in a pandemic and the council had to suddenly um flip all its resources and attentions to dealing with with but covid19 i think the pandemic <laughs> must really have helped the climate change agenda mustn't it you could really notice it you know everything was suddenly i don't know if it was placebo or what but the skies were clear because there weren't any airplanes there were hardly any cars on the road the sea looked really clear i mean the air quality down here is as you know sue is pretty good yeah. but it's just felt even better and you know i was taking walks in the coombe valley which is very close to us and it just felt like it was nature on overdrive you know spring and all the flowers were bursting and coming and alive everyone started growing vegetables even me yeah yeah everyone was eating there uh, and and foraging people were sort of getting into all this wild garlic as well and sort of I know. making bread making, from scratch, making all this stuff. Scratch, buying processed food. 
So I felt, yeah, there was more of a sort of awakening, I think, by the general populace about nature and how wonderful nature is and how important it is and how connected we are. So that was, I think it was a really good period that people had to reflect and to appreciate nature as well. But I'm, I'm a bit worried because, you know, things move so quickly within public eye, you know, partly because of social media, it's just it's stories, news, it's just so sort of, away instantly so I, I am worried that people have forgotten about that sort of um, connection that they possibly might have made with with nature and some sort of awareness um, back then but I, I mean hopefully hopefully this is the, the the pandemic has been a warning shot and people are are thinking a bit more about climate change now um, but uh, my main role at the moment is that I am the lead member for natural environment and leisure yeah. uh, what to call parks and recreation oh yeah <laughs> so what's park what's any news of what's happening in hastings um well at the moment in the country park we've got our beautiful belted galloway cows so they're basically these huge black cows with white belts around their um the trunk of their body around their stomachs yeah and let them roam in the country park because they they graze back a lot of things like thistles or they trample the thistles and, and, and the bracken. So it's a kind of natural way of keeping a lot of invasive species sort of down. And yeah. we find them with these tracking devices so they can just roam around the country park. But then they have these these kind of um, electric devices around their necks and we can yeah. track them wherever they are. Up to me, your, why, your picture's going all pixelated. Is oh, am I? Yeah, I don't know what's going oh. on. Well, let up. me... I'm going to close some, I'll close some windows. Okay. You can let me know. Is that better? I've closed oh. some Google, some, some windows. I have to be careful not to close your window. How's that? It's a bit better. It's not a lot better, but it's not long to go. But it's a shame. But most people take a photo anyway, but we can still hear you perfectly. So that's fine. Okay. I'm going to just close everything that I've got open. Uh, ding, ding. ding. <laughs> So, yeah, so a lot of my time now is taken up with meetings um, and, uh, you know, the sort of con the general concerns that councils oh, have. Now, yeah. So, you know, obviously bin collections is a big thing that I focus on and <laughs> uh, fly tipping. Uh, so it's kind of funny considering my background was sort of almost like sort of revolutionary, trying to change the world. But a piece up to this. I bet the question you're asked all the time is, "What about the potholes?" And what about the potholes? <laughs> and the ironic thing is, Hastings Council is not responsible for potholes. I know. <laughs> so I mean, it sounds like I'm passing the buck, but it's East, it's East Sussex County Council. Yeah, but I think they're quite cute. The potholes. <laughs> I love, do you know what I really love? You know, down our roads and that, the, the pavement yeah. is sticky and they've got all funny yeah. paved stones and little plants grow out between them. I, I am loving the plants oh. as well. I'm trying to kind of change people's perspective on, on street plants, the weeds that grow between the cracks in our pavement. Awesome. Because, yeah, I, th I think they look nice, but then they also support a lot of biodiversity, so a lot of insects um pollinating yeah. insects they 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 need them as well and it's it's only because we think that you know a street should be spotless in terms of plants that we eradicate them with actually a horrible east sussex go around spraying it with glyphosate uh, which we're, we're running a campaign to try and you know change that but oh, I love it. It. is everyone's gardens are all higgledy piggledy you know you know yeah, i love that really manicured really and they go around the lawn with clippers and make it look perfect. I love yeah. the shambles. Yeah. So much. Well, stuff. beauty yeah. is in the eye of the beholder. Yeah. And I love the world that along the front and in the gardens around here, the council do a really lovely job. Making yeah. I, mean, I know people yeah. go, oh, money on plants, but it just gives you a little bit of joy in your heart, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. It is really beautiful. And like, all the local businesses have been very spoken very highly people I speak to about how they've been helped by the council during this virus and the lockdown and everything oh that's good yeah, yeah. we were pretty slick in getting out the business grants yeah uh, 
were really we our, our turnaround was was really fast like people yeah. were saying oh, i sent the email off and two hours later the money was in my account I so know. yeah I could, really proud of I i've got friends i've got businesses in here then in bexhill which is different councils that can't get anything from bexhill but here couldn't be more helpful oh that's great to well hear done, <laughs> well done hastings borough council yeah. <laughs> all down to you about um Alexandra Park. So that is one of the things that I'm kind of um in, in charge of. In and, conversation. <laughs> and uh just to, to to highlight how amazing and unique Alexandra Park is, it's got it's got the most diversity of trees of any park in the country. And it's not that big, is it? It's, it's not that big, but we've just got a huge diversity of trees and, and then Leonard's Gardens, how beautiful is that? Oh, St. Leonard's, the landscaping of St. Leonard's Garden, gorgeous. All our parks around here were very spoiled. I and know. then the like, little gated gardens and walled and gardens. We've got, the sea. <laughs> we've got the sea, we've got uh, the country park, we've got the Coombe Valley Countryside Park, we've got tons of ancient woodland, we've got so much ancient woodland. It's, yeah. it's unbelievable. Have you been up to Church Wood in Hollington? That once, I think, by mistake. Yeah, by oh, mistake. yeah, gorgeous. Sorry. Absolutely gorgeous ancient woodland. And is the tip under Hastings Council? Um, partially. So that whole Coombe Valley area, it's, it's mixed ownership. It's like Wother, Hastings Council, and East Sussex County Council, it's and then Big well tip. A farm. It, yeah, it is quite a well organised tip. Yeah. I quite like around it. It's quite interesting. I know. And they, have they still got the stuffed toys when you arrive to make it look cute? Uh, I think so, yeah. <laughs> I love the fact they go to that bother. <laughs> now, you've got 10 minutes left. Anything really okay. important you need to share with us that we can help with or anything? Um, I think um, things around behavioural change. So, as we were talking about street plants, um and things within your what you can plant within your garden so you know plant planting flowers that encourages pollinating insects like bumblebees so lots of lots of uh pollinating insects and um yeah sort of it's all about i mean tackling climate change i think is going to be uh a, it has to be about a change in human behavior so Obviously, we desperately need the government to pass a lot of radical legislation um, because it's very difficult to make changes at, at a council level if we don't have a budget and if we don't have legislation that supports us. Um, but in the meantime, I think, you know, the general populace, we need to be taking action and we need to take responsibility um, around our own behaviour in terms of how much carbon we're using, um, you know, what vehicles we use to get around, what we buy in supermarkets. So making consumer choices that um, that uh, uh, tackles climate change. So try to buy, buy produce that's been grown in this country, um, or at least within Europe. I have the, the Europe rule where I, I you know, because there's some fruits that you can't, you, you have to, like bananas, God, if I had to give up bananas, but they're, obviously they're not grown in Europe. But um, I do try and buy all my produce from from you from the EU or at least you know prioritize Britain. Yeah. So things like that, um, and and what vehicle you use, and then also I think also getting involved with politics. So a lot of people they say, oh, you know, I'm not political. Everyone is political. You know, do you care about free healthcare? Do you care about free education? Do you care about um, universal human rights? Do you care about climate change? If you care about all these things, then you are political. And it's really important. We live in a democracy. It's so important that people interact with the political system that they are living in. Um, so at the very least, people should vote. Um, and then, you know, the next step is to, to, to be in contact with your elected representatives, so your councillors or your MPs, um, and really take an interest in, in what the government is doing um, and m make your voice heard. I think it's really important because you know so many people we sit at home and we complain and we look at the tv and we feel in despair but when you actually do things it makes you feel a lot better and it it, it does have a positive impact on the world as well mm. but you know the time 
this I've never you know I'm looking on I've never lived in such weird times of what's going yeah, on. Yeah it's pretty weird. It's just the whole world is like head. But I think it I know and if it only makes a few people change I think it'll do so much better. But I yeah even me so I used to throw rubbish out my car window I wouldn't dream of doing it now I'd be horrified. You know and like and I think most people when we went past the beach yeah. day it was really quite clean because people had realised they had to pick up their rubbish yeah. and take it home. And I think yeah. it's getting there a little bit that people are remembering what's going on. Yeah, I mean, we should take heart in all the, you know, achievements that people have have succeeded. Yeah. Um, you know, like within just my generation, the whole thing about being vegan, you know, I went vegan in 95 and and now it's, it's trendy to be vegan. And back then I would never have thought, I subscribed to the Vegan Society magazine and my pin-up was Uri Geller and Moby, <laughs> the only famous <laughs> vegans out there um I'm too, uh, i just i couldn't cope with it it's too complicated for me to be a vegan well you don't have to be you know you don't have to be vegan but make sort of, me. So it's only because i don't like it but um I yeah don't yeah you know, i don't eat much processed food or anything yeah you can just make small small choices that yeah. that like vegan one day a week or don't eat meat one day a week or... exactly and you know walk to work one one day a week yeah. um so your local corner shop instead of um you know getting the car or whatever i like so, the fact that corner shops were doing really well in the virus oh yeah our corner oh, shop everyone was going to them and they had all the stock didn't they they did did you go to gizem Noor on norman road it's one that one corner. uh it's kind of halfway along norman road it's like an aladdin's cave of oh, i know where it is but i don't think i went there Oh, they were they just had everything. They had rice, they had tin beans. They, yeah. they oh, wait, you know the, um, that funny shop, the paper shop in Silchester Road. Oh yeah. I went in and I go, you've got any eggs by any chance? I went, yes. And he bought me out a tray of 36 eggs. Cost three pounds. It's <laughs> curious, isn't it? It's it's the most curious shop in the world. It's very curious. I know, We've got a but... curious shops in St. Leonard's. I know. I love the shops here. They're all there's only like about three. It's the co-op, isn't there? And spa and boots. The only proper shops. All the rest are just independent shops. Yeah, yeah. We're, it's brilliant. I mainly yeah. shop independent. Yeah. And and we, we, we haven't got any chain restaurants hardly at all. It's just hardly in St. Leonard's. No. Just nice. It's a lovely mm. little place. It's brilliant. It's. I just think actually I've got everything I need here, which is probably why. You know, I moved here in 2003 and then never went away. I've just sort of year, I know the <laughs> lockdown. This year, I think I've been to Eastbourne the week before lockdown. And then hmm. two weeks ago, I had to go to Marlow for the dentist and visit my aunt in Surrey. That's all I've been. The rest of the time, yeah. I've just been here. Yeah. I'm perfectly happy. I love it. I don't really yeah. like it. Being. I love it here so much. Border to Leonard's board of life. Well, what I'm going to do is <laughs> I'm going to put this talk on Facebook because I know not many people are watching because of the time and because of the weather and people are on the beach. But I found it so interesting. Oh, look, Vanessa Crawford saying what wonderful you are and how inspiring. Oh, look, she spent her student days in Kingsmead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you're right. It was very inspiring. And do you know what, Sue? I never actually went into um, uh, the history about my dad. He was that was actually very. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> he was a uh, Indian revolutionary in the seventies, and he was yeah. involved in the you know the the anti racism Brick Lane protest against the fascists. Yeah. Um, and he was part of you know the whole Rock Against Racism. He was leading the crowds to Victoria Park yeah. um, in in the That's rally. The yeah, so all uh, those people sitting on the beach don't know what they've really missed. I know, don't know what they've they don't know what they've missed. Yeah. So yeah, I mean that's that was all happening. Like Hackney was such a sort of melting pot of of cultures coming together and ideas and anti racism and you know, progressive thinking. Um yeah, it was it was a very inspiring place to be, definitely. Debbie Darling, she's watching, let me tell because Debbie Darling, she knows who you stay with in London. Oh, Lovely. does she? Yeah, does she know Henry and Dominic? Dom? I don't know if she knows Ken and Dom. I don't know if she knows Dominic. So Debbie, oh, it was oh. so hilarious when I just met. She came running across the road. Sue, Sue, 
when I stay in London, I stay with someone who knows you. So that was because his wife's a um, campaigner, the same as you, isn't she? The peace campaigner. Yeah. Yeah, so Henrietta's come to us. She's been to Afghanistan a number of times now. She's a regular and she's a great writer. She has a lot of writing. Um, so yeah, I get to go and stay with them. They're very kind to me whenever I'm in London. They host me. Uh, I've got the key to their pad. It's pretty oh, sweet. <laughs> I just love the fact that everyone I meet here knows someone I know from London. It's so weird. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> But I think we're doing this again Thursday, but it's private, aren't we? Something similar. Uh, apparently, yeah. Uh, I've got I've got details, but, yeah. but um, oh, I've enjoyed this. Is there any, um, little Dan and Lily, have any pictures have arrived yet? If there are, could you stick them up for us to see? Oh, oh beautiful. Lovely. Oh, thank you. Any others? Because quite often they, people finish them afterwards and send them in late. So wait and see if there's any more. Oh, I feel I've learned so much. You know, sometimes you're a bit tired. I feel really sparked yeah. up by what you've told oh, me. Oh, that's good. Yeah, so I'm going to share I, it. Make every... Oh, no, we've only got one so far. But I'll tell you when Hitheroos comes from Japan, that'll be so quick, cute and lovely. Oh, I can't wait. It'll be beautiful. Oh, Debbie, so when you see Dom, say hello for yeah. Debbie. Debbie. Debbie, yeah. darling. I will do. Hey, okay. Debbie. Okay, <laughs> When we in the early eighties, we used to hang out together and have fun. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what else? Well, really, I think we finished. Oh, but I have. I want to thank you so much. I've really enjoyed it. It's, I've learned so much, and I'm going to be even more careful now about what I do. Oh but yeah, I, definitely. I've got a car because I've got bad knees. But I, I, I will really let you off. But to be honest. A gallon of petrol lasts me about a month and a half. Yeah, and I often I sometimes jump in your car for lifts to B and Q. Yeah. Sometimes, <laughs> don't you? Yeah, I still, you know that plant you got me for my birthday. All those. Oh years yeah. Ago? I've still got it. It's still alive. Oh wow! Brilliant. I know. Oh, as well. I want to see you in real life soon. Well, we could just stick our head out of the window and we'll probably see each other. I could pop round. We could have a distant cup Chip of something. I've got to go down the beach in a minute. Yeah, I'm going to go down the beach. I've got to go and see someone in their beach hut. Well, thank you so much, Marv. Enjoyed I really have enjoyed it so much. Thank you. And thank you. In. We'll see you Thursday. And thank you, you too. Thank you and all. Little Dan, you've done a lovely job. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Isolation. I want to thank the Fountain on Queens who started the idea. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye.